So thank you all for coming. It's such a great honor to be here. And actually, I gave a few talks at Yale. So if this is the identical talk you heard before, so bear with me. And I'll try to give it a different flavor. So my research focused on in vivo gene editing in cancer modeling and screening. And why do we do this? And first, why do we do genome editing? Because genome editing allows us to edit the genome. And in terms of genetics, it allows us to knock out the genes or alter the genes or edit the genes the way you want to elucidate the mechanisms of the genes function. And more importantly, we would like to approach, use genome editing in therapeutics, like directly change the genetic information to affect the disease tissues, trying to cure the disease or trying to slow down the disease. And one is, one has to know the molecular mechanism of why genome editing works in vivo. And because DNA gets broken down by UV, by light, by chemical resources and mutagens. But the host can repair the genome pretty efficiently using two major mechanisms. One is non-homologous end joining, and one is homolo homology directed repair. And by ho non-homologous end joining, the broken DNA was linked together by the enzyme. And, but this process is, imperf is not perfect. Most of the time, you will have insertions or deletions in these processes. And homologous repair templates can be mediated by the homology directed repair, and the new foreign DNA can be introduced into the, the host genome. Anyway, so many methods have been utilized in genome editing, from the endonucleases to traditional homology directed repair, and to recombinations such as Cree and FRIP to zinc finger nucleases, which was invented a decade ago, and later to Talon, tail like activated domain nucleases, and most recently CRISPR, which is called cluster interspace, regular interspace parenchyma repeats. This is actually the originated from bacteria, which encodes the enzyme to fight the phage. So when people utilize the CRISPR enzymes, they re engineer the, the CRISPR proteins including four major components. First is the, the RNA-guided endonucleases, which is the Cas9 enzyme. The second one is actually the RNAsH. But in fact, people realize RNAsH, the, the host genome, the mammalian cells also in, encode the RNAs, so the RNAs is no longer required for in vivo genome editing. And there are two more pieces which is required for gene editing. One is the chaser act RNA, which is called trans-activating RNA and one is the small cRNA or CRISPR-associated RNA. When people fuse these two together, they make it sgRNA or single-guided RNA. So when the single-guided RNA or the separate component chaser plus cRNA was introduced to mammalian cells targeting any places in the genome, you can, uh, this, uh, the, the enzyme class 9 can effectively in induce the insertions or deletions. So genome editing has been utilized in multiple applications lately, including gene knockouts, gene corrections, gene fusions, or when people kill the activity of Cas9 and make it a catalytic death enzyme, and then fuse this to activate a domain or repress a domain. People can do activator or uh, CRISPR activation, CRISPR repression, or epigenetic modifications. When this was tethered to imaging modalities, the CRISPR enzyme can guide the specific foci of using confocal Im uh, imaging as well as RNA tracking. And by playing multiple tricks with this, you can split Cas9 into two different parts and make it an uh, inducible Cas9, either using the two split co components or using light to control or using chemical to control Cas9. And when the CRISPR enzyme was when the CRISPR system was like scaled up to a high throughput scale, you can do genome scale knockout screens, activation screens, non-coding RNA screens, as well as in vivo screens, if you apply this in vivo. So why is this important for cancer? Because the cancer genome is extremely complex as people sequence thousands and thousands of patients in many cancer types. This is not a single gene disease. It involves the mutations of multiple genes, 
and many of these genes can either contribute to acceleration or suppression of the tumor growth. So how do we understand such a complex landscape? And what makes the cancer mutations harder to study is that they can occur with new combinations like P10, P53, NF1, VHL, KRAS. These genes, the cancer biologists know for decades, but these genes can occur in combinations that you never expected before until you sequence the patient and then you discover, oh, these genes can in fact occur in different combinations <coughs> and what are their roles in tumor progression. So what we have done in the past was actually pretty simple. By simply taking the genome editing system to apply it to somatic cells, what we did is that we directly deliver the Cas9 complex and guide RNAs targeting P10 gene. The P10 is the famous tumor suppressor, and in fact, it's upstream of, of AKT. So by delivering the P10, Cas9 targeting and P10 guide RNA into the mouse liver using hydrodynamic injection, we can see these clones of cells which receive the, the CRISPR complex actually got knocked out of P10. As you can see from sequencing, you can see the insertions and deletions right at the P10 exon. And these cells will lose P10 staining, but they're still able to proliferate. And it's exactly these cells we can see phosphor AKT activation. So it's suggesting that we can knock out genes directly in vivo using somatic gene editing. And if we knock out two genes at the same time, for instance, P10 and P53, and these are the important tumor suppressor genes across most cancer types and, of course, have been implemented in liver cancer. So we can induce liver cancer rapidly by simply injecting the CRISPR-Cas9 complex targeting two genes. So you no longer have to generate the two mice and breed over and over again. And if you are doing the combination of four mice or five transgenic mice, which is a, quite a headache to breed, and you can simply design four or five guide RNA and co-deliver into the organ of interest to see what the effect of gene knockout has to your organ of interest or tissue cells of interest. And we have also demonstrated the proof of principle gain of function by direct in vivo delivery of crispr cas complex targeting beta catenin as well as the four ad a donor oligo encoding the gain of function mutations, changing the serines and theorines to alanine. So by delivering the, the donor oligo in the crispr cas complex, we, we can by after sequencing of the liver, we can see that these oligos are in fact incorporated into the liver. So, and this is indeed functional. By changing the nucleotides of the beta catenin, we can find that the beta catenin is actually being activated. So anyway, so because hydrodynamic delivery has a limitation, we can only target the liver, but how do we target all other cell types? But Cas9, remember, is a huge enzyme. To allow Cas9 to be delivered, which requires more cumbersome delivery method. So why not just put Cas9 in the mouse first? So we just knock in Cas9 under the conditional cassette of lock, stop, locks in the Rosen 26 locus and then breed the Cas9 transgenic mice. So with these mice, we can simply breed these mice to a Cree reporter, uh, the, the Cree uh, activator to activate gene, uh, Cas9 expression in any tissue we want as long as it's a Cree. Or we can simply deliver Cree with an AEV as well as sgRNA. So for instance, if we want to target the brain, we simply package AV with sgRNA and CRE and inject the, the place you want using stereotactic injection. So for instance, if we inject sgRNA against new N, the injected site for the new N protein, they will all abolish it. But in the contralateral site, new N protein was expressed. And as we can see from Cas9 increased staining, this is due to Cas9, not just uh, off-target effect. So we decided to utilize this approach to model cancer. And lung cancer is the first one we go for because it is the most, uh, it, it is the most frequent cancer type in the United States and as well as the, one of the most lethal ones. So for instance, 
we wanted to see what these genes do if we mutate them directly in vivo. So P33 is the most well-known tumor suppressor gene in lung cancer. And KRAS is a gainer function oncogene in lung cancer. And there is also a list of tumor suppressors which has loss of function mutations and oncogenes which has gain of function mutations. We wanted to model gain of function and loss of function together. So we decided to build a vector, a single AEV vector that are capable of inducing both loss of function mutation in P53 and LKP1 as well as the gain of function mutation by com combining the KRAS guide RNA to a KRAS homology directed repair template, which encodes the KRAS G12D codon substitution. So we package this vector using AAV and deliver into the mouse lung. And then we sequence the mouse lung after harvesting the genomic DNA. And what we can find is that we can indeed put in, hom by homologous recombination, the gain of function mutations targeting KRAS, as well as we can knock out P53 and LKB1. So, and then we prepare histology, and then we see that the mouse, tu the mouse lung indeed developed tumors, and then we use laser capture to dissect these individual tumors and sequence a few of them to see what happened. And then we find some tumors ha have KRAS, but some tumors don't. This is, again, the heterogeneity of the model system. So for instance, in these three tumors, tumor one and three don't have KRAS threes, but tumor number two has roughly a 60%, which is suggests is heterozygous KRAS. So, and again, by infecting the, lung, the mouse lung with the AV9 KPL, which is the vector knocking out P53, knocking out LKV1, and introducing KRAS g D mutation, these mice, 100% of the time, they will de develop lung adenocarcinoma, compared to the controls, which none of them develop such a tumor. And this type of method induced early grade, which is grade one lung adenocarcinoma, when we stack the mice early, which is three to four weeks. And then uh, the yeast tumor can progress to higher grade, such as grade two lung adenoma, and then later to lung grade three lung and carcinoma, and into grade four, which is more invasive, and enupride. So this is the time course of the KPL compared to the LAC-Z vector control, which has no tumor at all. And then we can see on average 4.5 tumors per mouse lung in grade one at one month. And then this can progress to higher grades, such as grade three, well, you don't see in one month, but you do see quite a lot in three months, and occasionally the grade four tumors. And then we also perform the histopathology to characterize these tumors. And we can see these KI67 staining suggesting these cancer cells are rapidly pro uh, proliferating, and endothelial cells suggesting there's angiogenesis, and there are uh, phospho SPC suggesting these come from pneumocytes. And the similar method can be utilized by using two guide RNAs targeting ELK and ELM4, which will create a fusion protein of ELK and ELM4. And this, in fact, in induced lung adenocarcinoma, which is done by Scott Lowe and Andreas Ventura's group. And also, you can combine this with the traditional KRAS P53 model uh, led by Tyler Jack's group so that you can, you can activate KRAS knock out P53 and then act and then knock out either APC or NKX 2.1 or your genes of interest. So and this is a demonstration of how we can edit the genes in vivo and then to induce tumor models for studying cancer progression. But we are also interested in using this model to scale it up to identify new cancer genes. So we would like to perform in vivo genetic screens to identify bona fide functional factors governing cancer progression. And this is feasible because now you can simply design guide RNAs and pull them into a, vir uh, pull them into a library of plasmids. And then you package all these plasmids to be a viral vector. And then you can simply use these 
pull viral vectors to infect the cells and then conduct the pull screen such as just like when people did the shRNA screens. So <coughs> we pilot our first screen to study cancer metastasis just because of the central importance of cancer metastasis in solid tumors because metastasis is the major solid tumor lethal factor. The primary tumor can be resected or treated easily with radiation but metastasis is hard to treat because it can spread all over the place in the patient's body. So we utilize the simplest metastasis model which is the subcutaneous transplant model by mutating the non-small cell lung cancer cell line which is not metastatic and by pool library mutagenesis we generate the mutant cell pool which consists of a library of cell population or a library of cell soups which consists of all types of mutants and these mutants are more capable of generating meta metastasis compared to the untransduced which is the parental clone so suggesting that some of the mutants indeed gain the capacity to metastasize faster and then we just simply sequence these metastases to see what clones these are and in the first mouse we identify CDKN2A and P10 and backband 1 and this is not very surprising but consistent with the clonal evolution of cancer metastasis but the clonal heterogeneity can be very different from mouse to mouse so, so for instance in mouse 2 you see NF2 being the dominant clone followed by a list of other clones so we also plot all the uh, we also sequence all the tumors we inject and then to identify a list of genes and but before going into a gene list I would like to show you the dynamics of mutant, mutant cell pool evolution when you transplant it in vivo. So the plasmid consists of a log normal distribution of the library which is 64,000 guide and then we, if you transduce these library to cells you can see still a log normal distribution even though some essential genes were depleted but this is still 90% or over 90% of the library but when you transplant after two weeks you lose about 20 to 30% of your representation and a majority of those will become lowly represented but some of those ones become highly enriched and as the tumor progressed more than 98% of the constructs were gone all you can detect is uh, less than 2% of the enriched clones and this is even more evident in the metastasis settings this is less than 0.4% of all the constructs but as you can see in a log scale they are highly enriched compared to the others so a log scale of 10 is a thousand fold difference compared to the uh, earlier stage tumor and then we just take all these clones out and use statistics and then we can rank them according to the, the frequency uh, like how many times they occur in each mice and then by looking at the top of the list we can see NF2 not surprising and then P10 not surprising but there's also lots of other strange genes that we are still in the progress of following up and characterizing but just to make sure what we see is true we just pull these we just pull the top genes out and then design four sgRNAs per gene and two independent sgRNAs and two sgRNAs coming out from the library and then we can validate seven out of eight at a statistical level of p.05 suggesting that the, these genes if they lose their function it indeed pr uh, promotes cancer metastasis and two of those were microRNA like well, microRNAs such as MIR-345 and MIR-152 and also this is a sidetrack story but we to study cancer metastasis we also designed a circulating tumor cell capturing chip to capture these CTCs and we are actively investing in what generates CTCs more frequently but back to the microRNA story because microRNA regulate protein coding genes by binding to their 3' UTR and either lead to degradation of the message or lead to translation inhibition so these are very interesting so, so we pulled MIRS-345 out 
and then we design four guide RNAs, and then we can see that these guide RNAs indeed generate cutting at this locus, destroying the, the stem loop structure of the MIR-345 RNA. And then when we transplant the MIR-345 knockout cells in vivo, and we can confirm indeed these MIR-345 knockout cells <coughs> metastasize a lot faster than control cells. And we also see that the MIR-345 effect is not due to primary tumor growth. As we can see, there's very little effect on MIR-345 knockout in primary tumor growth, but indeed there's a dramatic effect in cancer metastasis. And when we look at a few human patient data by comparing the metastatic tumor samples to non-metastatic tumor samples in either bladder cancer or lung adenocarcinoma or kidney chromophobe, we can see that MIR-345 is indeed downregulated, suggesting the role in tumor suppression in these cancer types, including lung adenocarcinoma. And to further investigate MIR microRNA regulation and to further identify other non coding RNAs in vivo, we just recently, in my lab, designed the microRNA library. This consists of a small pool of guide RNAs targeting only the microRNAs, not anything else. And Adan Kodina, who is a rotation student, cloned this library and sequenced it and found that we have a good representation and he's actively utilizing this library to perform microRNA screens. Okay, and finally, I would like to hand over to Andre. But before that, I would like to show a few of our future directions. Is that we wanted to systematically <coughs> identify functional elements in physiological and immunological and pathological settings because of cancer immunotherapy is a very important direction because you can utilize the body's own immune system to fight cancer cells, which is way more effective compared to some other mechanisms in some tumor types. And so with that, I would like to thank my previous supervisors and colleagues who work with me closely, as well as my new lab who with a few rotation students and who joined and didn't join. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay.